Hey everybody, welcome back. We have another lesson in film history this week. Uh, we are on to another decade, so it is the 1920s. We did the 1910s last week. Um, and we're going to focus on Germany and Russia this week. That's not to say that, you know, film history didn't progress in the United States. We're just kind of looking at these two countries because we have like uh, booming industries that just kind of take off in these two different countries. In the United States, there's um, plenty of stuff going on in Hollywood. There's the rise of movie stars. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in Hollywood, but um, over in Germany, we have some really cool stuff. So German cinema didn't start in the 1920s. In the 1910s, um, Germany had a whole film industry. They had several independent production companies, and they're kind of in the same um, uh, ballpark as what ended up happening in the United States in um, Hollywood. So several independent production companies not tethered to any kind of central body like the Edison Company or the Edison Trust that uh, existed. Um, so uh, that sort of changes uh, starting in 1917. Uh, with the establishment of UFA. So um, UFA was established to promote German ideas and culture. Uh, that, that was the um, tagline, I suppose. Uh, so UFA is owned by the government, and they start buying up production companies in the country. So um, all these independent production companies are kind of scattered throughout uh, Germany and UFA starts buying them one by one to establish kind of um, a singular government run um, production company. And you're going to see this like a lot through history in different countries. You'll see it in um, Soviet Russia as well. Uh, so following World War I, it shifted its tone or focus or um, its messaging uh, to kind of rebuild the country's image internationally. So um, World War I, Germany's on the losing side of things, and they're required to pay, um, pay countries a whole lot of money because they lost, and they are very looked down upon by the rest of the world. So UFA um, is supposed to create um, productions, uh, film productions, that will elevate Germany in the eyes of the international audience. Um, Germany's unstable economy allowed UFA to absorb more companies. So um, in 1918, around 1918, it might be 1919, um, that's the start of the Weimar period in Germany. Um, and if you haven't heard of this, it, it's a period between um, uh, World War One and World War Two, or the uh, before World War Two, even before the rise of Nazism in Germany, um, and there's just this like hyperinflation going on in the economy, and people are uh, very destitute, and other people are very rich, and there's there's a whole lot of uh, economic struggles in the country, and because of that, um, all of these these independent production companies just go bankrupt. So they like make one film and then are forced into bankruptcy and then UFA just absorbs them. So uh, they, they end up um, getting their um, actors and producers and directors. So almost um, every film um, after 1918 to 1920 is produced by UFA um, exclusively, almost. Um, German cinema at the time is really focused on these costume dramas. So they're these very elaborate period pieces uh, with a lot of production design in them. So like um, uh, very elaborate costumes and very elaborate sets. Um, and they're like basic melodramatic films. Uh, they employed actors from across Europe since there's no language barrier associated with silent films. So that's something that like we don't really experience today. And it's kind of interesting, you know, um, uh, in the silent era, there's no language like where uh, the, the films that you'll watch from both Germany and Russia today will have English um, inner titles. And that's not how they were viewed in Germany or Russia. But like, it's very easy to just like splice out 
the intertitles from one language into another. Therefore, it doesn't matter if, you know, like the actors are from uh, another country and kind of well known in that country. So, again, kind of elevating um, uh, German cinema in to international audiences. So when people think of German cinema in the silent era, they're not usually thinking about uh, these costume dramas. Instead, they're probably thinking about German expressionism in film. So German expressionism is not just limited to film, but it's also an artistic movement that happened in the country. And let's take a look at a couple of examples from that. So what we see is these high contrast, exaggerated features of people, um, certainly nothing um, that, that is intended to look like, uh, like photo real. Um, it, it's um, not cubistic. It's not quite surrealism, but it's close to those things, right? So um, it has a very distinct aesthetic when you look at these things. High contrast, lots of black and whites, and very, very um, deep shadows and uh, exaggerated features. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about German Expressionism as an art movement, I'll include a link to a website that I think is really great, and it has um, a much more uh, elaborate description of what was going on at the time in Germany. So the first film to attempt to sort of capture that, that German Expressionism aesthetic in film was this movie called The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari in 1920. Um, so uh, with this film, despite Ufa having control over almost every production company in Germany, Caligari was produced by an independent production company called Decla. Um, Decla went bankrupt soon after Caligari. Um, so Dr. Caligari wasn't super popular among people at the time in Germany, um, but it was very, very popular among uh, critics um, and filmmakers of the time. So uh, a whole lot of the um, well-known German silent era filmmakers were highly influenced by Caligari, and that spawned um, the German Expressionism in Film Movement, and we would see several landmark films uh, come out in Germany in the subsequent years. So Fritz Lang, who directed Metropolis, which is still one of the um, most expensive films to ever be made in history, uh, and he also directed M, which we'll take a look at uh, next week in our next lesson. Um, and F.W. Murnau, who um, directed Nosferatu, which is an option for you to look at this week. And uh, The Last Laugh, which will also be an option for you to look at uh, this week. So those people that were uh, highly influenced by Caligari um, uh, used that aesthetic influence in their films, and that sort of spawned this whole um, German expressionist movement. And I think that you can see a very clear influence from these films uh, to American films that would be a little bit after. So um, noir films in the 1940s and um, horror films uh, kind of throughout time, honestly, um, have their their roots in uh, the these early German expressionist films, especially Caligari, which um, kind of sets up. Um, the slasher genre. It's like a proto slasher uh, before slashers existed. But you could certainly see the influence on uh, really modern filmmakers like Tim Burton. So if you watch a um, Tim Burton movie that's not brand new, maybe um, maybe from the, like the 1990s or even early 2000s, you should be able to see a very clear influence uh, from German Expressionism on his aesthetics. So probably the reason why uh, U.S. filmmakers weren't influenced quite like German filmmakers were from this expressionistic movement um, was because German films were banned in the United States after World War I. Um, and a lot of U.S. producers felt good about that because they didn't have to compete with German cinema at the time. So again, if you think about um, uh, just how different uh, the film industry would be uh, internationally at the time, like it, regardless of what 
um, what language is spoken, uh, these films are very easily translated to audiences with uh, different languages. So in Germany, um, you can have films with intertitles that are English, and it's every bit as good as a film that's made uh, natively with the English language. And a lot of these German films had very, very large budgets. So because of the weird economics and the Weimar period, um, a lot of production companies were able to make very, very expensive movies. Uh, but as soon as they did, um, they tended to go bankrupt right afterwards because um, the, the production cost so much and uh, they wouldn't get that money back. Um, it, it usually resulted in a bankruptcy and then UFA would absorb it. UFA would actually um, uh, go bankrupt themselves uh, with the production of Metropolis in 1927. So um, inflation adjusted, this film would cost approximately $200 million to make. Um, so uh, very, very expensive film at the time. And if you're thinking about what's going on, um, uh, economically, it's probably a very bad idea. Uh, that said, um, it, it is a landmark film that employed over 37,000 extras. So there's plenty of scenes where people are running around in the streets and there are so many people. Um, and if you, uh, it, it's something that just like wouldn't happen today. So like, uh, with the advent of CGI and stuff, you don't need that many people physically there. Um, instead you can kind of place them with computers. So if you want to see something that's completely unique in that regard, uh, Metropolis, um, is certainly that. So to bankroll Metropolis that would cost $200 million basically um ufa could not um afford it so they um struck an agreement with paramount and mgm so those united states uh production companies and wow they uh really took advantage of ufa in this deal so uh the amalgamation company called parafumet right that's just smashing paramount ufa and mgm all together um so they used UFA's distribution arm to release Hollywood films in Germany. So uh, UFA owns kind of everything. It's kind of like um, the inverse of what happened in the United States, where the Edison Company um, had all of production controlled by him, and then uh, these rebel film producers went to uh, Hollywood and started their own production companies and then kind of disrupted all of that. Instead, UFA is now the solid um, controlling body of film production and distribution in Germany. And uh, Paramount and MGM are now going to use uh, UFA's uh, theaters to distribute their films in Germany. Um, so uh, Paramount and MGM would loan $4 million, which would, uh, uh, inflation adjusted is about $60 million, uh, to UFA for uh, production. So to complete the film Metropolis, um, they needed that much more. Um, and pa Paramount and MGM would loan exactly as much as they needed. Uh, and in return, 75% of the films shown in Germany would now be uh, produced by Paramount or MGM. So in all of their theaters, they're showing um, American produced films uh, three out of four times rather than uh, German produced films. So you can understand how this might um, disrupt or maybe crush the uh, German film industry. And by 1927, the same year Metropolis would uh, be completed, uh, UFA is nearly bankrupt and sold to a newspaper industrialist who focused the company on German nationalism. And you might be familiar with that term, German nationalism. So uh, UFA is now, um, not, not 1927, but like it's headed towards a purely um, Nazi propaganda um, company. 
So around the same time over in Russia, there's a lot of interesting things going on, and we're just going to go over them kind of briefly to give you some context uh, around what's going on with the film industry. I think it's really uh, essential to know. That said, you know, um, you can certainly dig a lot deeper into this stuff, just kind of breaking down the bullet points for you. So in the early 1900s, Russia is ruled by, under an imperialistic government known as as the Tsardom, um, and cities become much more populated and poverty is rampant. So, you know, it's not like kings and queens, but sort of like that. There's several of them inside of uh, Russia at the time, and there's no real, like, centralized Russian government, and other countries don't really like... Uh, like to to deal with russia very much and they're falling behind um other countries around them uh, in 1917 there's the bolshevik revolution where lenin leads a revolt on moscow and takes the city and establishes moscow as the first communist state and russia uh be becomes under control of the bolsheviks uh, other countries around russia start dealing with lenin as the um, country's leader because they didn't really like the uncentralized version of Russia and this is kind of uh, unites the entire country under the Bolshevik government so they have the first communist country but they don't really have control over the entire country even though other countries are sort of acknowledging that um, instead um, there's a whole lot of people that like are are pro sarists uh, or capitalists and everything's kind of in anarchy right now um, and there's a lot of anti-bolshevik sentiment as um, and a civil war breaks out in russia and lenin um, establishes a red army and there's a white army that's like the the opposite side and it's like kind of um uh it's not just people that are pro-sar but they're also they're, they're basically just anti-Bolshevik, right? Like they have uh, different ideas of how the country should be run. So Lenin with his red army basically crushes um, the, the white army. And in 1918, they uh, execute uh, the Romanovs, which is basically the end of the Sardom. Um, it's the last uh, family dynasty uh, the entire family is killed, so there, there's no way that like um, there's any kind of heir to um, you know the the Russian Tsar. But the Red Army continues uh, across Russia into Asia and uh, uh, establishes the Soviet Union. So you may have looked at a geography book um, prior to you know like the the 1980s and seen the Soviet Union as this gigantic swath of land. So communism spreads across Europe and Asia in the form of the Soviet Union. So in 1918, um, after you know uh, the, the Bolsheviks have kind of taken power in Russia, uh, there's a company called Narkompros that was established. It's a government controlled company that absorbed many of the independent production companies developed under the Tsarist rule. And there weren't many of those, but the Bolsheviks saw the power of film. They, they saw um, the ability for film to really um, deliver a message to the masses. So not everyone can read, but uh, visually they can see a story. It's kind of like um, theater, but it, it could be uh, done on a massive level. In 1919, the VGIK is established. So that's the first film school that existed anywhere in the world. Um, so um, So there's an interest to educate filmmakers in the um, the art of production of film, and because um, raw film was uh, such a limited commodity in Russia, um, what what most of these students had to do was work with films that were already made. Um, but they could experiment with those films. That's not to say that they couldn't film anything, um, but 
Uh, they had a whole lot of film reels of things that were already shot. Um, and how do you experiment with those film reels? Well, through editing. So you can um, cut that stuff up and experiment and test things uh, that maybe weren't around before. And from this, um, the Soviets establish montage. Um, so a montage is just a, a series of non-continuous images. So does that make sense? I'm not sure if that makes sense to you without actually seeing it, but we'll take a look at uh, one of these very shortly. A series of non-continuous images. So most of the time when you're watching a film, uh, everything happens in continuity. So if someone opens a door, we expect it to be maybe like the camera moves outside and we see someone walk through a doorway outside from that door, right? continuous action from one shot to another uh, but non-continuous action would be you know um, uh, a shot of something and then a shot of something else that's completely different right montage is a series of those and you have probably seen montage before um, the rocky training montage um, there's basically a montage in every film nowadays so uh, pick your film and you'll probably find a montage in there somewhere usually the idea with a montage is to um, kind of compress time so you don't need to watch Rocky train for two months straight instead you can have it for a few minutes and see his progression from not being very good at boxing to being really great at boxing and with this idea of montage, the Soviets establish all of these um, very specific uh, methods of montage, metric, metric montage, rhythmic montage, tonal montage, overtonal montage, and intellectual montage. Each of these have its own kind of um, uh, distinct style. Metric montage is just every shot is the same amount of frames. Rhythmic montage, there's a visual rhythm. Remember... You know, there, there's not music and there's not um, th there's no sound in these early silent films. So it's a visual rhythm and tonal montage utilizes the tone of the film to dictate how it is cut over tonal montage kind kind of mixes those things together an intellectual montage um, puts two disparate images together to give you a whole new idea of uh, meaning right so there's an idea that goes along with this this thesis plus antithesis equals synthesis and then there's a little equation there that your um, film professors probably won't like one plus one equals three and uh, what does that mean exactly well uh, basically there's a German word for it called gestalt the uh, sum of the parts are greater than the parts individually so like the uh, as a group um, the group is stronger than any single shot so you just see one shot uh, and then you just see one shot but uh, and that that has some kind of value to it but if you see one shot and then the other shot there's a bigger um, a bigger concept that you get out of that and here's a quick example of how that uh, equation kind of works so this is an experiment uh, that would later be called the Kuleshov effect so you see um, these images let's take a look real quick a soup and a man and then we have another child in a coffin and then a man looking and finally a third one and it's um, a beautiful woman on a sofa and a man looking so uh, this is a quick recap of those things um, when shown to audiences they would perceive um, soup and man looking as the man is now looking at the soup and maybe they even perceive things like he's hungry for that soup um, in the second shot the child and the man so it's the same shot again like same exact shot right the, no change no extra frames or less frames or uh, an alternate take or anything child and man looking uh, 
audiences would perceive that he's sad about the child or has some sort of feeling about that child, that there's there's a relationship between those two images. Same goes with uh, the final shot with the woman and the man, that he may be looking lustful at the woman, right? So um, you put um, that emotion on this person. He didn't act in a way that he was like thinking that stuff. Instead, it's... Um, the series of images and their relationship with each other where they happen uh, that tells you that story so one of the best known filmmakers to come out of the soviet montage school of thought is sergey eisenstein and the best known film that he made is called battleship potemkin in 1925 it is a highly influential film uh both both positively and negatively. It's a pro-Bolshevik, anti-Tsarist propaganda film, and it's banned in the United States, the United Kingdom, and other countries, and it's banned in the United Kingdom uh, for a very long time, longer than any film in history. Uh, It uh, depicts actual events, but shows the Tsarists as really cruel and violent. So the idea is to kind of sway public opinion towards the Bolsheviks, at the time when there's um, plenty of anti-Bolshevik, anti-communist sentiment in the country and across uh, other countries as, you know, um, communism is spreading. Uh, the, the techniques in the film would become highly influential to world cinema. So, um, all these montage techniques are used, uh, throughout the film. Uh, but in particular, um, there's, there's a sequence in the film called the Odessa step sequence, which is very, um, uh, emotionally driving and really drives home the message that, that, um, you know, the country wanted to, to, um, portray in the film as well as, you know, um, uh, Eisenstein himself. Uh, And chances are you've seen some form of the Odessa step sequence in uh, other films. It's been parodied a bunch and just kind of referenced in a whole lot of films as well. Uh, So if you've ever seen the, um, like a baby carriage uh, rolling down some stairs, it's probably a reference to um, the Odessa step sequence in Battleship Potemkin. The film was well received and uh, was one of Joseph Goebbels' favorite films, if, you're, if that name sounds familiar. He is in charge of propaganda for the Nazi party. Um, so he called the film a marvelous film without equal in cinema. Um, it's important to note that Eisenstein disavowed uh, Goebbels and Nazism. Uh, Goebbels asked Eisenstein to come to Germany to uh, manufacture the uh, propaganda films for uh, German cinema at the time. Uh, He did not do that, Um, but Goebbels did want to model the new German cinema after the film. So so not too long after this, there's uh, maybe the uh, biggest propaganda film of all time called uh, Triumph of the Will. And I can't say for sure that um, Triumph of the Will wouldn't have been produced at all without Battleship Potemkin um, coming first, but um, chances are it was at least influenced by the fact that Battleship Potemkin was so popular and so well-received and so effective. So that's it for the lecture this week. It's a little bit shorter, but I do want you to spend a little bit more time with the films and you can kind of choose your own direction with this. You can either follow uh, the German expressionist movement and watch a couple of films there, or you can uh, follow the uh, the Soviet Russian films with uh, montage and uh, these pro-Bolshevik um, messages and at least one of them. Um, you have some choices with German expressionism. I'll put like a list of four or five there, um, but you are kind of forced with uh, Soviet Russia. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an experimental film from 1929 called The Man with a Movie Camera that I think is really interesting. Not a whole lot of intertitles in that one. Um, and then Battleship Potemkin. Uh, on the German side, you have to watch. 
uh, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, uh, but then it's your choice which other one you want to watch. So there's a sci-fi one in there, there's a horror one in there. Um, lots of interesting things on both sides. Uh, German expressionism is much more like aesthetic and artistic, and um, the Soviet uh, films are much more editing and montage and um also propaganda in in one instance um so watch those films and then um your blog entry can basically be whatever you'd like on either german expressionism or uh the the soviet russian film movement so it's probably going to be about editing on one side and probably about you know um what it looks like artistically on the other side. So uh, good luck to you this week. You have a lot of freedom. Uh, use it wisely. And I will see you all in one week's time with some more film history.